And one of the best things we can do for our peace of mind is to crucify our expectations of others. I mean, really, just put it up there on the cross and get to the place where we no longer have an expectation of people to meet our needs because we understand that our water flows from a different rock, that our joy flows from a different place. Come on, Efam, shout at the phone. That I don't, I don't depend on people to provide for me what God has promised. It's already mine, and so they got really upset, man. And, and then Moses got upset, and he went to God, and he wanted God to be upset like he was upset. And Moses was mad because God wasn't mad. That's, that's what happened here. He was disappointed. It never stops. After all I've done for you, I've been here before. I have been here before. Even, even in high school, when I was the athletic trainer, water boy for the football team, Coach Meyer recruited me to be the athletic trainer, said you could get a scholarship. And one day I was mixing that Gatorade, so sweet, and I thought, I don't think they give scholarships for this. <laughs> I think he tricked me into this, you know. I kind of didn't like it anyway. It wasn't like I really cared too much about football. Football's fine, I'll turn it on. I'm not like some of y'all fantasy lineups and stuff. I got a real life. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But man, it was a relatively simple job. I did it for over a year. And the main part of the job, you know, every once in a while they would let me tape a wrist or an ankle. I think it wasn't even really people that was hurt. I think they just sent <laughs> cast members over. Because <laughs> if anybody was really hurt, Dr. Bounds came in. So I don't even think I was really taping anybody. I, I don't even think it was. But, but I, I did have one, one job. And every time they would have a water break, it was my job to turn on the water. That's right. Bobby Boucher got nothing on me. Well, I did it like clockwork. They blow the whistle. I was positioned close enough to the spigot, which was connected to the hose, which went to the PVC pipe. In Monk's Corner, it was fancy, with a PVC pipe with the holes in it, a trough of sorts, with the water would come out of the pipe. But I was the man who turned it on, and I turned it on about three or four times every practice. And one day I went over there to turn it on, and nothing came out. I don't know who forgot to pay the bill, but nothing came out. And those football players went to drink, and they lined up at the PVC pipe, and nothing happened. And they start yelling at me like these rebellious Israelites. Started yelling at Moses, started yelling at me, calling me Steve. I don't even go by Steve. There's an N on my name. Pronounce the consonant. This ain't Wheel of Fortune. Oh, I was mad. Yelling at me. For the one time, the water didn't come on. Hundreds of times, the water came on. One time, it didn't come on. And guess what? I'm not controlling the water, I'm just the one turning it on. So they were yelling at me, so I, I wasn't saved yet. Let me get that in. So I turned around and said, God bless all y'all. Only instead of God bless, I said some different BC vocabulary that is not appropriate for this church setting and holy people such as yourself. And in that moment, I forgot they were bigger than me because I do have a level of crazy that if it kicks in, I will stop caring how much bigger you are, and I would rather die than have you cuss me out. I got in my Toyota Tercel and I drove off. So. It all just kind of came back to me, man. I'm sorry.
Because all these times, I get Moses' disappointment, I really do. All these times, and this one time, all I've done for you, all the meals I've cooked, all the prayers I've prayed, all the compliments I gave, all the Christmas presents I bought, all the sacrifices I made, and you mean this one thing, this one time, and now you want to yell at me and disrespect me and ignore me? I figure Moses is tired of being taken for granted. Tired of people just assuming that you're always going to do it, and it's just easy for you. Until I realized that Moses wasn't really disappointed with the people. Moses was still dealing with a fear that he had carried with him since the time God met him at the burning bush and possibly before that, 40 years earlier, when he killed an Egyptian to try to rescue one of his fellow Hebrews. And he never really fit in because he was raised as an Egyptian, but he was by birth a Hebrew. And when he tried to defend the people that he was one of from the people that he had had to live with, Moses ended up having to run. That's why he ended up in the wilderness with the shepherd's staff to begin with. And that's why when God met him at the bush, Moses said, You got the wrong one. Pick somebody stronger. Pick somebody more capable. Pick somebody with more experience. Pick somebody who doesn't struggle with what I struggle with. Because I'll let you down, God, and I'll let them down. And not only, not only is Moses dealing with this moment, but he's dealing with 40 years of frustration. 40 years of frustration that you could argue were the result of his lack of faith when he didn't go in and fight and take the land God had promised. In a sense, what they're saying about Moses is true, and he knows it. It's not him he's it's not them that he is disappointed in. So, like for me, realizing in my adult life that my my core fear and a lot of the reasons that I withdraw and a lot of the reasons that I that I lash out, it really came to me one time early in my marriage to Holly, and it was a low-key argument, but all of a sudden it just kind of erupted, and I yelled at her, I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. It never stops. I'm not stupid. She said, I didn't say you were stupid, but I wasn't responding to what she said. I was responding to what I felt. Somewhere in me was something that told me that I didn't know enough. Probably back to my dad in some ways. He loved me. It wasn't that he didn't love me, but he kind of felt like it was him against the world and he didn't have a full deck to play with because of the way he was raised. And somewhere I probably started thinking that I was operating in life out of a deficit of intelligence. And so my first instinct when someone makes me feel stupid, what a phrase, when they make me feel stupid. How much power are you giving away to other people when someone can make you feel stupid? That's a weak mind, but that's where I, that's where I find myself sometimes, in that mental wilderness. That mental wilderness. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid sometimes up here, not that I'm going to get the Bible wrong or that I'm going to dishonor God, but unfortunately, that I will disappoint you. And every time we start a new series, I feel it, you know? Because I try to create expectation. This is going to be the best series ever. And then I hope baby Jesus and Mother Mary and the Holy Ghost will somehow help us because I don't want to disappoint you. And I'm sharing this autobiographically, but I'm wondering. Is like, do a lot of us function in this place that I, I don't want to disappoint you? 
And that's why I hide. And now I find myself, I don't even want to pick up the phone when people call. Because now, if I can text them back, I can carefully craft my response. Even in the smallest ways, I, I see this fear. I see myself withdrawing. I see myself wanting to, to isolate. And, and it's a tendency that I don't fully understand because I do love people. I really do love people. I've always loved people. I, I was the dude that hugged everybody in his graduating high school class, the whole 230 of them. Hugged them all. But I find myself sometimes wanting to withdraw. Find myself wanting to walk out. Find myself wanting to get out. And I wonder why. You know, like, am I, am I losing my love for people? It is all this getting to me like lights and cameras and all that? But I realized, I realized in the weirdest way one day what it was when a lady said to me, "I've, I've been going to your church seven years and I've never met you." And I said, "I'm so sorry." I took it like an accusation, you know. She said, "No, no, it's a big church." We love the minister. I said, okay, good. I'm sorry. That's, I'm really sorry, though. That's bad. You haven't met your pastor in seven years. I'm sorry. She said, it's fine. It's fine. Stop apologizing. Now it's awkward because I'm making it awkward. And then she made it awkward. She said, you're much taller on the screen. Well, that helped. You already see I'm insecure, woman. <laughs> but I don't want to let you down. You know, so, so when Moses has this moment, and I'm calling it a moment, but it's really not a moment. Because anytime something comes bursting to the surface, like Moses hitting that rock twice, when God specifically spoke to him to speak to the rock, not to strike it. And I know why he struck the rock, because this is the third issue it's the issue of dependence. You know, this staff was the thing that he carried with him. Like Tom Hanks had a volleyball, Moses had a stick. And now, in this moment where the community needs water, and this is to be their last test, but they don't know it. This is to be their last test to see if they really trust God, and Moses fails the test. What I could not understand is why did God tell him to take the stick if he didn't want him to use it? Why did God tell Moses, take the staff and, and then don't use it, just hold it and speak to the rock? Until I remembered what Moses said to God when God first called Moses. I'm not good at speaking. And before God could let Moses lead his people into the promise, he had to know, do you trust me enough? When God said, Moses, you can't lead the people, it wasn't for punishment. It was for protection. If Moses would have led them in, in the condition that his heart was in, with years and years and years and years of resentment building up, they would have all got killed the first time God spoke and they didn't do what he said. Because God needs someone who is not dependent on their staff. I know you struck the Red, the Nile River, and the Red Sea, and I know that the staff has been used to perform great miracles, and I want you to hold it in your hand, but have the faith not to use it. I want you to speak to the rock, and he struck it instead. And God said, you don't trust me enough. You've allowed this resentment to build to a point that it has killed your potential. When we allow resentment to build and build, and build and build when we never really believe that we are what God said we are, when we are constantly taking people's assessment of us as the ultimate reality, it limits our participation in the promise of God. It doesn't keep God from loving you, 
but it keeps God from being able to lead you into the great and precious promises that have your name on them. God said, I just need you to trust me. I know you stutter. I know you stammer. I know you're afraid of letting me down, but it's never been about you, Moses. It was never about your mouth. It was about my mighty hand and my outstretched arm. It was never about your rod. It was about the, the rock. So what are you trusting in today, my friend? The rod or the rock? Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.